I want to thank Reverend Nika for inviting me to be here today, and I want to thank each of you for the gift of your time and attention. And I also want to thank the unbelievable team that puts together these Sunday morning services. I had no idea <laughs> what goes into it until I had the chance to be part of it. That's the skill, the time, and the love and care that goes into preparing a Sunday service here is amazing. The script that is being followed by the team is 32 pages. <laughs> and they do it so beautifully. Today we... <laughs> We gather to lift up the call to love your neighbor, which for many people of faith is a commandment. But the phrase love your neighbor might feel at times like a cliche, like something you'd see on a bumper sticker. That's right, I'm sorry. Of course, we need, we need the slides, yes. <laughs> I've made the job for the tech team even bigger even today you have, Willie, you challenged us beyond. because we have sort of slides that will intersperse my, my comments. I pray we will not allow love your neighbor to become a cliche. Love your neighbor is a charge to all of us that is greatly needed in our world, in our country, and here in our city. The theme of today's service arose from an email I received last November from an organization called the Interfaith Sanctuary Alliance of Santa Barbara. It said, from March 10th through the 13th, 2022, our interfaith group is hosting our third Love Your Neighbor weekend with the purpose of encouraging faith communities to acknowledge this, their sacred duties to care for the immigrants in our midst and to provide tangible ways for faith community members to stand with their immigrant neighbors on a local level. We'd love to try and spread the message of loving our immigrant neighbors throughout the Central Coast. And we thought it might be beneficial to link up with our allies throughout the region. I shared that with Reverend Nika, who responded with an enthusiastic yes and invited me to collaborate, so here we are. Nika asked me to take part because she knew that I had taken some adventures with Love Your Neighbor. Our service this morning is happening in solidarity with many other faith communities who are also focusing on Love Your Neighbor this weekend as well. And the Interfaith Sanctuary Alliance is hosting a virtual interfaith vigil from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. today. The event will be a time to recognize the stories of our neighbors hold space for their suffering and compel our community to take action together. The link to the virtual interfaith vigil will be provided in the chat. And that's a flyer promoting the event. As you can see, it's bilingual, English and Spanish. As a Unitarian Universalist, I've always found the notion of love your neighbor to be comfortable and comforting. I've thought of it as kind of a shorthand for our values and principles. And other UUs seem to agree. Love your neighbor is a very popular theme in UU circles. And I'm going to share a few examples of that. And now I'm going to show one of my favorite uses of this phrase. <laughs> and I want everyone to know that Love Your Neighbor has official endorsement. <laughs> Love Your Neighbor is a vital theme in cultures and traditions across the world.
And during the pandemic, we've had a whole new outpouring of love your neighbor messaging. And here's a love your neighbor message, Southern style. <laughs> and some poetic license on the theme. <laughs> and a cheeky take on the phrase. <laughs> okay, and to cleanse our minds of that one. <laughs> Thank you. About five years ago, I was fortunate to find myself among a group of amazing people who joined together to form a community-based organization called Buen Vecino which is Spanish for good neighbor. One of those amazing people is our own Amy Reed, who is with us on Zoom today. Buen Vecino's vision is to cultivate an environment where the human dignity of every person is respected and where all people have equal rights. I hope you can detect the UU influence. Buen Vecino is dedicated to loving our neighbor through service, advocacy, activism, organizing, and base building. Base building means growing and strengthening the solidarity, influence, and power of social justice and human rights advocates in our community. Here's our website. And a couple examples of recent projects. We are going back into the citizenship fair business in April, which we've had to suspend for two years. We're so excited. Ren Vecino is like a beehive of projects geared toward loving our neighbor. And we've collaborated on several Chalice community forums and been blessed by volunteer support and donations from a number of Chalice members. You can speak to me or Amy if you want to know more about Buen Vecino. One of our efforts was a Love Your Neighbor project in 2020. When we learned of the first Interfaith Sanctuary Alliance Love Your Neighbor weekend, we decided to try a similar event in Ventura County. After consulting with several clergy members, including Reverend Nika, we decided to pursue a program that would be broad-based and would call on people of all faith traditions to reflect on love your neighbor in their own way. We gained sponsorships from three interfaith associations and planned a weekend with three components. One, encouraging congregations to focus on love your neighbor in worship and religious education. Two, holding a public interfaith unity walk in Simi Valley. And third was a interfaith love your neighbor program at uh, Samuelson Chapel at CLU. We created a logo, a website, Facebook page, and flyers, and sent letters of invitation to hundreds of faith leaders in Ventura County. We got an official proclamation from the city of Thousand Oaks declaring March 12th through 15th, 2020 as interfaith love your neighbor weekend. If you've ever wondered what an official proclamation from the city of Thousand Oaks looked like, here it is. Did I do that? No, it's what it's like. The proclamation was so, <laughs> so inspiring, it almost set the place on fire. Okay. Are we are we good again? Okay. 
So um, I'd love to share with you a few visuals from the 2020 Love Your Neighbor Project. I know it's a little hard to read, but hopefully you get the idea. This is me at the city council speaking when we got the proclamation. And that's what I just showed you. This is the program for the event at CLU. And I know you can't read it, but I just wanna tell you what was in this program. It opened with music from St. Paul's Baptist Church of Oxnard from their choir and then a procession of spiritual leaders, welcome and chalice lighting from Re Reverend Nika Eaton Gwynn, invoking sacred space from Alan Salazar, Chumash Elder, B blessings and prayers from Reverend Salazar, campus minister at CLU, Dr. Nushin Jah Jahagarini, California Zoastrian Center, Rabbi Richard Spiegel, Temple Etz Chaim, Omar Jubran of the Islamic Society of Simi Valley, Arash Payan of the Thousand Oaks Baha'i Community, Pandit Sharma, head priest of the Hindu Temple of Simi Valley, and then a keynote from Dr. Sprague of the Gibord Center, a dance performance from the Ballet Folklorico of Simi Valley, and then closing words from Reverend Nika, music again from St. Paul Baptist Choir, and a benediction from Reverend Benjamin Thomas of Bethel, African Methodist Episcopal Church. On the day of the event, the curtain came down and we had to cancel it. So that was disappointing. It would have been so beautiful. So many people had prepared and worked on it. We had to cancel the unity walk and the event due to the spreading coronavirus and the need for social distancing which was the best way at the time to love your neighbor. We had to do it. I have no regrets. The process of interfaith collaboration was a amazing growth experience for me, very humbling, especially as a person who grew up as an atheist and entered the world of religion through Unitarian Universalism. I learned that we UUs do not corner the market on the values we espouse. I discovered commitments to values very similar to ours among people of many other traditions. My world and relationships were expanded and enriched. For me, love your neighbor sounds like an idea that's easy until I reflect more deeply. Deeper reflection brings up some challenging questions. Who is my neighbor? And what does it mean to love them? Is it just people that are close in proximity? Or are my neighbors a bigger, a bigger community than that? Can I claim to love my neighbor if I do so conditionally when I, when I feel like it? Can I buy off my responsibility to love my neighbor by giving charitable donations? Or should this value be a cornerstone of my life? Are people who aren't born yet who will inherit our planet in the future, my neighbors? Is loving your neighbor purely an individual thing on a personal level, or can it be collective? Can a congregation love its neighbors? Can our city or our country love its neighbors? A few years ago, my family took a vacation to Mazatlan, Mexico. Here's where we stayed. We had a splendid trip. And while we were enjoying the buffet, here's what some other people were doing just a few miles from where we were. There are people in this image 
scrounging through the garbage dump to try and find something to help them get through the day. Here's where some of them were living. There are little makeshift, makeshift structures like this all over that area where people live. Are those people my neighbors? Well, of course they are. And my trip to Mazatlan is really just a symbol for my life every day. For my life every day. I'm wondering if it sounds like I'm preaching right now. Well, what are you here for? <laughs> How do I love my neighbors who did not hit the lottery of chance that I did by being born into conditions that provide me with so many privileges and advantages which I have done nothing to deserve more than anyone else. While billions of people face the deprivations of poverty, lack of access to a living wage, and suffer from war, violence, and forced migrations. I believe the call to love our neighbor requires more from me than just a warm and fuzzy feeling. Love your neighbor is a call to action, a call to do something, to share something, to change something, to care, to be engaged. As the Nobel laureate and Holocaust survival, survivor Elie Wiesel said, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. What does it mean to love my neighbor? I can't wait to hear what Nika has to say. <laughs> Thank you, Willie. You gave us a lot to think about and uh, asked lots of good questions. I'm not sure I can answer them all in this moment because that was a lot to take in, um, but lots of great food for thought. Thank you. So my friends, what does loving our neighbor look like? I mean, Willie's modeled many wonderful ways of doing it. So grateful for that. But around us, we see people fighting, and asserting that their way of life or their nationality or their ethnicity or their politics or skin color or their religion is superior to others. And we see people judging each other as less than or deciding that trans folk or Muslims or people of color or poor people are not as valuable as they are. When we experience derision and division promoted as tactics to keep us separate and create an us and them mentality when there's escalating violence and hate and wars fought on the basis of I am right and you are wrong or I want what you have. It can be easy to dismiss this idea of loving your neighbor as just pie in the sky fantasy, right? Or as a lovely unachievable ideal. But if we consider ourselves spiritual people, and I know that those of us who are here today in person and online feel that, then all major world religions call us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And I just want to show my, my stole today, which is all about loving us all in our different expressions of our spirituality and our ways of being. And of course, as Unitarian Universalists, our first principle asks us to do this, to honor the inherent worth and dignity of all. And as Willie showed us, it's easy to say we love our neighbor and put up signs, but how do we actually live out that spiritual value? How do we truly embody it as a way of life? We might wish to, but in practice, loving all our neighbors is more than challenging. And many of us are taught prejudices from a young age to assess whether we're safe, to blame others when things don't go well for us or be jealous or suspicious of each other. And of course, our instincts lead us, lead us to have fear 
of the stranger and to seek safety above all and thereby brand anything that's not familiar a threat. In fact, fear of the stranger has been part of human nature since the beginning of time. It's our fight and flight survival instinct that causes us often to reject what is foreign to us. So loving our neighbor, all of our neighbors, can be a really challenging call for us humans. Yet it's an ideal so worth working towards. And I congratulate you, Willie and Amy, for starting Buen Vecino in our area to specifically focus on doing that work. Reverend A. Powell Davis was the minister at All Souls Unitarian in Washington, D.C. for many years. And he lived from 1903 to 1957. He was an activist and a passionate interventionist against World War II and later McCarthyism. He was a keen observer of society's dysfunction and was also a committed integrationist. And the Washington Daily News said about A. Powell Davis, too often the religious man is a bigot, a humorless doctrinaire, the crusader, an intolerant ass. The Reverend Davis was certainly religious, righteous, and a crusader, but he was broad-minded, witty, and kind. And A. Powell Davis wisely discerned that when religion tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves, on the face of it, the command is good. But when we come to look into it, we are struck with a shocking sense of irony, he says, because our trouble is that we do love our neighbors as ourselves. We love them in just about the same way. For all too often, we do not love ourselves. We hate ourselves. We hate, that is, our real selves. We hate our inferiorities, our instabilities, our cowardice, and we hate the fact that we're not as talented or not as beautiful or not as graceful or not as gifted as other people. We hate ourselves for not being more than we are, and we transfer this hatred to the world about us. And we form a fantasy, a very pleasing fantasy of what we are really like, of what we could do if only we had the chance that other people have. And we tell ourselves that these other people represent an injustice done to ourselves, and we become conspirators against them. And that is where the trouble begins, he says. So if A. Powell Davies is right, that we cannot love our neighbors unless we love ourselves, then how do we truly transform within? What qualities do we need to nurture to be able to really, truly love our neighbors? Probably the number one quality to practice, which is part of our Chalice mission statement there on our wall, is of course, Compassion, beginning with self-compassion. If we learn compassion for ourselves, then we can have more compassion for others. If we don't have compassion for the disliked, the judged, the rejected parts of ourselves, we're going to forever scorn those traits in others. Now, we might approach loving our neighbor as a righteous, good thing to do, but we won't truly be inhabiting the ideal unless we're living it from the inside out. So I encourage us to keep finding practices that grow our compassion within. And one such practice is, of course, the song that we often sing together. I think we might be singing it next week, in fact. May I be filled with loving kindness, which is based on the Buddhist metta meditation or loving kindness meditation. And in that, we begin by offering loving kindness to ourselves, and then we extend it to family members or friends, and then to acquaintances or people that we hardly know. And finally, to those whom we find difficult to love or even 
our enemies. Again, like A. Powell Davis recommends, we begin by loving ourselves in order to love one another better. But it's not a selfish kind of love. Rather, it's a compassion for our broken, hurt, and struggling parts. If we can have compassion for our negative traits, for our difficulties, for the ways in which we fall short, then we can have more room to love our neighbor with their differences and challenges. Another way to grow compassion, my friends, is to surround ourselves with people who are loving. And I see those kinds of people right here in this room. Many friends and members of our UU community model compassion. Just watch our fellowship respond when people are hurting or struggling. This community is truly compassion in action. We love our neighbor through providing meal trains for those who are sick or hungry. We love our neighbor by visiting the lonely or sitting with the bereaved. We love our neighbor by providing necessities for Afghan refugees or local farm workers or Ukrainian refugees. We love our neighbor by showing up at rallies and actions that support our immigrant neighbors or denounce hate. We love our neighbor by feeding our healthcare workers and making meals for the unhoused. Surround yourself with people who show compassion in this way and let it guide your heart. Or think of people in your life or spiritual figures who have shown you compassion. Or if you believe in God, let the Spirit of God fill you. Imagine these beings, these people guiding your life, embracing you, caring for you. Like most things, my friends, whatever we focus on, grows. So practice loving kindness and compassion with yourself in your family and let it expand outwards. And to practice it regularly, you may wish to join one of our social action or pastoral care teams or volunteer to help with our outreach. There are so many opportunities to practice loving our neighbor right here in Chalice. The next tool that will help us love our neighbor is another ubiquitous spiritual quality, and it's curiosity. I talk about curiosity often because it's so important. Curiosity inquires rather than making assumptions about each other. What is it like to walk in another's shoes? Who are our neighbors, really, beyond a stereotype? What matters to them? What do we have in common? When we lead with curiosity, my friends, rather than judgment, we keep conversations open. And by finding commonalities among our differences, we grow our connection and understandings. Now, our differences often appear on the surface, things that you can immediately see or be aware of, whether it's that we speak a different language or we have a different skin color or we like different food. But beneath those differences lie a sea of commonalities. We are human on this planet together, making it through a complex life, sharing struggles, joys, sorrows, and hopes. Curiosity asks us to dance hand in hand with openness and non-judgment, a receptive, open heart and mind. It's all very well to be curious, but if what we discover through our curiosity is then judged or rejected, our efforts have been in vain. Our curiosity should lead us to understanding or caring. It requires acceptance of the other as they are. Acceptance of difference. Finally, all of those qualities do well to be wrapped in a cloak of peace. If we're at peace within ourselves, we'll be at peace with those around us. 
will act from a more grounded, centered place and be able to remain peaceful in challenging situations. So my friends, to truly love our neighbors, we need to nurture these qualities within ourselves and within each other, among each other. Foster compassion, curiosity, openness, acceptance, and peace in our daily lives. It's something that we can practice here together at Chalice. Are you all willing? Yay, you're alive. <laughs> And there's another possibility, too, that I want to share with you. I want to share the perspective of astronomer and NASA scientist, Dr. Jill Tarter. In her work on searching for life on other planets, she calls us humans earthlings. And she says that this cosmic exploration has the philosophical equivalence of holding up a mirror to every individual on this planet and saying, See, all of you, you're all the same when compared to something out there that has evolved independently. And by seeing it in this way, she transforms people's perspective and trivializes the differences among humans, differences that we're so willing to shed blood over, when indeed we are all human. We are all earthlings. We are all the same compared to something else out there. And I'm not meaning to minimize our differences. But if you see yourself as an earthling before you see yourself as a Californian, she says, then I think that sets the stage for tackling really difficult challenges on a global scale. So, my fellow earthlings, May we remember that we're all here on this beautiful planet together, sharing short lives filled with adventure, struggle, joy, pain, and love. May we become increasingly compassionate, curious, open, accepting, and peaceful. And may we come together as neighbors, seeking our commonalities rather than emphasizing our differences. And may we bring peace like a river into our own lives and those around us and really model loving our neighbors as ourselves. It begins right here with me, with you, and with all of us. May it be so. Amen.